Okay, so in this video, we're going to start talking about just the basic characteristics of investments, um, what they're like, and things you need to know about them. Okay, so the first thing we're going to start off talking about okay, is our plan of action for investing. Things you need to do and consider and think about when you're thinking about getting started investing. Okay, so the first thing you need to think about is what's going to be my asset allocation. The asset allocation just means the percentage of your investments that are in stocks versus the percentage that are in bonds versus the percentage that are in cash. Okay, and that outline is really important because that determines over 93% of the performance of your uh, portfolio, of your investments. Okay, and actually it doesn't matter that much uh, if you choose Apple stock or Google stock. What matters is if you choose stocks or if you choose bonds. Okay, and there's a lot of research to back that up, thousands of research papers, and over and over and over, the research consistently shows that what matters is your asset allocation, how much of your overall collection of assets, which we call your portfolio, is in stocks versus how much is in bonds. That's what's going to determine your long-term results, far more than picking and choosing each individual stock. And so as individuals and professional financial planners, we don't pick stocks. We don't, we don't do that. We don't try to guess when the stock's going to do good, when it's going to do bad. We don't try to predict when the market's going to go down or when the market's going to go up. Okay, All the evidence suggests that this simply cannot be done reliably enough to use to plan your retirement with. Okay, So if you want to do that, if you have fun picking stocks in the stock market, that's fine. But you need to do that uh, as recreation, as fun. Okay, have your retirement account over here that you just set an asset allocation and forget it. And then you need to have a separate fund over here that's just for fun, that you play with, that you try to beat the market in. Okay, and if you make some money in it, great. If not, your retirement's not compromised. Okay, so you need to think about that though. Now, stocks are like the gas pedal. Okay, they make you go faster, they get you a higher return, but just like in a car, the faster you go, the more likely you are to crash. Okay, so stocks, are they'll give you a higher return, but they also give you higher risk. And so you need to think about how much risk am I willing to take in order to get uh, and earn some interest and, and not take more than that amount of risk. Okay. Uh, next, you need to think about how interested am I in selecting my investments and tracking them, paying attention to them. Okay, Do I want to do it myself or figure it out, study it out, or do I want to hire an expert to help me? Okay, and there are, are some cost-effective ways to get some expert help, Okay, which I'll talk about later. Okay, Which instruments should be using? Do I do stocks? Do I do bonds? That's all part of your asset allocation question. Okay, And lastly, you need to think about, first, how much liquidity I need. Second, how much risk can I accept? And third, what rate of return do I need? What interest rate do I need? Okay, and you can calculate the interest rate that you need. It's a simple time value money problem. If I need to get to $3 million and I have 150000 and I can save 500 a month, what interest rate do I need to earn? You can calculate that with your calculator. Okay. Now, talking about liquidity, uh, let's talk about it. Okay. So liquidity has two aspects. Okay, It's a measure of abilities of an asset's ability to become cash quickly. So can I sell it? Can I turn it into cash and spend it quickly? And secondly, can it does it retain its value? Okay, So uh, <clears throat> probably the most liquid asset other than cash itself is your checking account. right? Can you get cash out of your checking account quickly? Yeah, right? very fast. Secondly, can you? does it hold its value? Will the value of your checking account go down if you don't cut any checks? No, right? It holds its value. So the value only goes up and down when you tell its value to go up and down by making deposits and withdrawing money. Okay, so a checking account is super, super liquid. Okay. Now a house is highly illiquid. It's not liquid. Okay. Can you convert it into cash quickly? Generally not. Even if you can get an offer in a day, it still takes a couple of weeks or a month to get the paperwork lined up and to make that process happen. Okay. Um, does it retain its value? Mm, generally, yes, but it can lose value. 
Okay, we saw a stock market crash and a real estate market crash in 2008. Okay, but it may does doesn't have to be that. What if what if your neighbors sell their house and move and someone else comes in and they have four big dogs that are really loud and the house gets really run down and it looks really gross, that's going to affect the value of your house negatively. Okay? Uh, what if the city decides to build a new dump and it's right next to your house? Okay? Well, that's really going to hurt the value of your house too. So houses can't be sold very quickly and they don't retain their value. So they're highly illiquid. Okay? Stocks are kind of in between. Most stocks can be sold very quickly, but do they retain their value? Will you be able to sell it for what you paid for it? Ah, that's, that's a bit of a different question, right? It's a bit iffy. Sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down. Okay, so you can sell it quickly, but it doesn't necessarily always retain its value. So it's kind of moderately liquid. Okay? And the thing to keep in mind is that the more liquidity you have, the less return you're going to get. Okay, so your checking account, what interest rate does it pay you? Half a percent? Quarter of a percent? Maybe one percent? Very little, right? Your checking account pays you almost no interest. That's because it has, first, very high liquidity. And secondly, it's very, very low risk. And when you combine those two things, you get an asset that pays you very little. Okay, now that's okay though. Because the purpose of your checking account is to be there, to let you engage in transactions, buy things, right? Its purpose is to be there and be spent. And so when you think about it that way, it makes perfect sense that a checking account is important to have, but it's not going to give you a high rate of return. Okay, That's okay, because that's not its job. When you're saving for retirement, though, you need to take some risk and you got to get rid of some liquidity because you need to get a good return because that will help you tremendously to be able to have enough money saved up to retire comfortably. Okay? But you can't get more return without more risk and or less liquidity. Okay? And that's an important point. Okay? So here's our investing pyramid. This was in the readings. Okay? So as you start at the bottom, those cash and cash equivalents, those FDIC accounts, that's your checking and savings accounts. Okay? They're super liquid but, and super safe. And that's why they're on the bottom of the pyramid. Okay, so there at the bottom, the money in your checking account, savings account, that's safe. That's as safe as any money can be. Okay, as you go up the pyramid, though, your ability to make more money on these assets goes up, but you also get an increasing risk of losing your money. Okay, so options and futures, these are sophisticated, complicated financial instruments. Okay, and they have no place in most people's uh, retirement portfolio. Okay, if you're going to use those, you need to be a sophisticated investor or a business person or someone who's using them very carefully because they're very, very complicated. And as a general rule, if you don't understand something, you shouldn't buy it. Okay, so they're very complicated, but they're also extremely risky. Okay, you can invest a thousand dollars and lose three thousand dollars with an option. Okay, that's extreme amount of risk. On the flip side, you can invest a thousand and earn three thousand, okay, but you can't get a chance to earn more without increasing the chance that you'll lose more. Okay, so options, futures, collectibles, those are all very high risk and are not a very good idea for most people to own. Okay, collectibles is like cars or any of your. A lot of people for a while were collecting uh, Beanie Babies. Okay, I remember. In high school, hearing people say, oh, yeah, my mom and dad, they're buying Beanie Babies, and they're going to sell those Beanie Babies to make a fortune. It didn't work out. Okay? Or if you've ever watched uh, one of those pawn shop shows or something like that, uh, just one of those storage unit shows, collectibles just, if you get just the right one, you get real lucky. You can make a lot of money, but most of them lose all of their value or most of their value. That's what we mean by high risk. Okay, You might make a lot of money, but you're probably just going to lose a lot. You might think, okay, so the assets at the bottom of this pyramid, those are the best ones because they're safe. That's good. But they have problems too. Okay, So yeah, as you go down the pyramid, you get safer. Less chance to lose the money you've put in, but you also, because you're not earning very much interest, you also have a much bigger chance of losing purchasing power. Remember, I talked about inflation in the introduction to this unit. OK, 
Okay, so as the prices of things rise, your money's got to earn enough money, enough interest for you that you can both earn more money and keep up with that. So if you take all your money and you put it in a Ziploc bag and stick it in your toilet tank, okay, that's safe. You're not going to lose those dollars, it's, right? There's, there's no stock market crash can affect that. But you're going to be falling behind because the prices of everything out there are increasing. Okay, and so you don't want to keep too much money at the bottom of the pyramid either. The top is too risky. It's too dangerous. But the bottom is too safe. Like you need to get more return. Okay, so you need to have asset. You need to have some assets at the bottom of the pyramid. Right, you need the liquidity that your checking account has. But you need assets also that are in the blue. Okay, in that sweet spot. Real estate, stocks, mutual funds, but and bonds okay these are what people traditionally think of when they say investments okay, and so they get a good balance of risk and return and liquidity okay so you need some at the bottom to keep the household functioning and then you need a lot in the middle to earn you the returns that you need to keep up with inflation and retire successfully now I talked in the intro a little bit about keeping your eye on the target sit down and calculate how much you need what what are you going to need first uh, sometimes it can be simple and you can use the the tools we've used in this class to calculate it but sometimes it can get very complicated okay don't be bashful about calling a financial planner and asking for help okay a lot of financial planners will offer hourly services you pay them a hundred dollars and they'll sit down with you for an hour and help you figure out a long-term plan how much you need to save what interest rate you need to earn etc because okay? it can get very complicated okay? it doesn't have to be Okay. But once you figure out what you need, don't get greedy. Okay. Just focus on getting what you need and not taking too much risk. Because it's when people t start taking more risk to make more money, they get a little greedy. And so they start gambling more and more and more to try and get more and more returns. That sets them up for a colossal failure, a catastrophe. Okay. And you don't want to fall subject to that. Okay. So just... Keep steady, hold the course, know what you need, get it, and let it be good enough. Now, a good way to manage this is through diversification. Okay, So diversification is basically the idea that you don't want to keep all your eggs in one basket. Okay? So this chart shows you the benefits of diversification. So let's say you're thinking about buying stocks in two different companies, company A and company B. If you put all your money in company A, your investments are going to follow this green line okay, up and down and up and down and up. that's what stocks do if you put all your money in investment B it's going to follow the red line up and down and up and down that's what stocks do okay. but if you take half your money and put it in A and half your money and put it in B the result that you get is this purple line now let's notice a couple things about this line first did it earn as much money as the green line at the end of this time period, the end of this chart, the purple line is below the green line, isn't it? So you didn't make as much money as you would have in investment A. The trouble is you don't know whether investment A or investment B is going to be the one that's going to make more money. You don't know which one it is. And there's a good chance you put all your money in A and A turns out to be the worst one. You just don't know. So if you buy half of each, you diversify and buy half of each, mm, you may lose out on a little bit of return. But what else do you notice about the purple line? It's very, very smooth, right? It doesn't bounce around up and down and up and down nearly so much as the red or the green lines do. Okay? That steadiness that stability it's not bouncing around that is a reduction in risk okay that bouncing up and down and up and down that's what risk looks like in investments okay so the more stable and smooth and consistent uh, the performance of investment the less risk it has so diversifying buying some of each it reduced the risk you had to take while still giving you very solid results 
So if, if you were to be asked, what is the benefit of diversification? Is it higher returns? Mm, no, right? It's not higher returns. What diversification does is it lets you get, get the same return, but for less risk. Same return, but for less risk. Is it simpler diversifying? Does diversifying simplify the investment process? The answer is no, because you have to find, in order to diversify properly, you have to find investments that don't move in the same direction. Okay, so let's think about it. If you own three companies, and those three companies are Reebok, Nike, and Adidas, you don't really have a lot of diversification there. You have some because you have three different companies, but because they're both shoe companies, they're going to have a tendency to move in the same direction. So let's say something happens to oil and the price of rubber goes up. Okay, that's going to cut into the earnings of all three companies. So all three companies' stocks are going to start to uh, not do so good at the same time. So if they're all going down at the same time, there's no diversification there. Okay, so you need big companies and small companies. You need domestic companies in the United States and international companies in other countries. Okay, you need uh, retail companies, you need finance companies, you need technology companies, and you need manufacturing companies. You need all different types of companies and all different types of industries in all different types of areas. And it takes, it can be hard to find those types of investments that do that for you. Okay, but it doesn't have to be hard. We'll talk about how in just a minute. Okay, diversification, does it make it cheaper? No, does not reduce the fees you pay to invest. What it does is reduce risk. Now, we've talked about stocks and bonds. You've read about them a little bit. Let's talk about mutual funds, okay? A mutual fund is a way to get professional advice expert management of your investments and diversification automatically. Okay, So how it works is an investment company takes money from a bunch of different investors. Let's say you have 100 people who all want to invest and they all have $1,000. Which you can't buy a lot of diversification for only $1,000. So what do we do? We all come together, we pool our $1,000 together so now we have a big pile of $100,000. And then we find someone who knows about investments and we hand them the $100,000 and say, here, invest all our money together. That's a mutual fund. Okay? And the mutual fund manager can invest in stocks or bonds or all other types of securities and assets. Okay? And so they're going to decide which ones they're going to do. Okay? Mutual funds can be active which means the fund manager is actively going out trying to find the best stocks and trying to decide when to buy and when to sell, etc. Or they can be passive, meaning the, the mutual fund uh, manager just tries to track an index and that's a lot easier and therefore a lot cheaper. So let's think about how much money do we need where then? Okay, so first off, money you need in the next year should be in cash. So like Everything you're gonna to use to pay your bills and your emergency fund. Okay, if you have some short-term goals, like you wanna save up for a trip to Disney World, okay, keep that in cash. Okay, because you need to not lose that, you need to not lose it. Okay, you need to not risk that money. It needs to just be there, right? We talked about, okay, what asset am I gonna buy? What's the purpose of the money? In this case, because you're gonna be spending it in the next year, that money needs to just be there. Money you need in two to five years, okay, put that in a high yield savings account, a certificate of deposit, or maybe a low risk mutual bond, mutual fund that's full of bonds. You can hold it for the short term. You're gonna to afford to take a little bit more risk here, but you also uh, need to not take too much risk because you, you don't have a lot of time to recover if you should lose money in any of these assets, okay? Money that you're gonna hold for 10 years or longer, that's where you're gonna to wanna to buy stocks through a stock market mutual fund, okay? Now, as a general rule of thumb, your asset allocation should be about 100 minus your age. So when you're 25, about 75% of your portfolio should be in stocks. When you're 50, about 50% 50 should be in stocks, okay? When you're 80, only about 20% should be in stocks. 
Okay, that's a very rough rule of thumb, but it can be helpful. Okay, now if you don't want to bother checking that, because if you want to, what this means is every single year, you need to go in and change how much of your portfolio is in stocks. And that's a lot of work. And that's a hassle. And a lot of people don't like to do that. Okay, so if you don't want to do that for yourself, take the time and manage that, then you want a target date fund. Okay, so what target date funds do is they, it's a mutual fund where you set a date. Say, okay, I wanted to retire in 2070, let's say. So you pick the target date 2070 mutual fund. And what it will do is it will gradually reduce the amount of stocks you have in your portfolio at, over time. And so you don't have to go in and figure out how to adjust it to get the asset allocation that you want. It does it for you automatically. And research has shown that target date funds more than make up for their cost because that shifting of asset allocation is tremendously valuable. Okay, so they're a very good investment you should consider using.